The problem was you had to keep choosing between one evil or another. And no matter what you chose, they sliced a little bit more off you until there was nothing left. At the age of 25, most people were finished. A whole goddamn nation of assholes driving automobiles, eating, having babies, doing everything in the worst way possible. Like voting for the presidential candidate who reminded them most of themselves. That's a quote from Charles Bukowski's book, Ham on Rye. Now, in an age such as this, it's really important, I think, to listen to the voices of the misanthrope. The misanthrope, the one who hates people, who hates society, is usually the first one to get a pretty solid beat on what's fucked up in the world. Now, this particular quote really stuck with me ever since I read the book first time years ago. And I find it really resonates even more now when I take a look at our evolving, devolving, overall political landscape. And yes, I am speaking about the president. Now, before anybody goes to say that, oh, it's Trump derangement syndrome, hashtag orange man bad, well, orange man is bad. But this isn't some shrieking, technicolor, social justice ramble. This is actually more commentary on our society, I feel. The truth is, is that Trump, while a lot of people like to look at him as sort of the source of the problems that we have, I can't help but feel that to a greater degree, he's actually just a symptom of them. In 2016, when more hardcore MAGA-type Trump supporters were polled or reached out to her in interviews of sort of on the street kind of deals. One of the most common things you would hear them say as to why it is they supported Donald Trump was because he says it like it is. All right. Now, to a certain extent, a good swath, a good portion, I might even go as far as saying maybe even a majority of them genuinely believed that he was that kind of wild card outsider that we desperately seemed to need. Somebody who'd come in and dismantle all of the mechanisms of lobbying and influence, and as he promised to do, drain the swamp. Now, as we know now, none of that came to pass. In fact, he pretty much stacked the deck with industry insiders and lobbyists and the very sort of slimy influence peddlers he was talking about when it came to that swamp reference. But the other side to that perspective about telling it like it is always kind of struck me as a euphemism for he doesn't use big words. Now, if you're the kind of person who can look at a blustering asshole like that and see a reflection of yourself in some way, well, that's, I don't know, that says a lot about you. But aside from even that, the very notion of this folksy humdrum appeal that politicians across the board tried desperately to present to the public in their bids for office and power. It's kind of a sad commentary overall, I feel, about the ways in which we pick our leadership. To harken back to something Socrates, one of the godfathers of our Western philosophical tradition, often liked to say was that, well, he had some serious doubts about democracy. He liked to ask whether or not an ill-informed and undereducated public would really be well served by electing leaders based upon their own sets of values and ideals. Now, this isn't a condemnation of democracy, as the opposite of it is generally and almost universally worse. But all the same, his comparison, his uh, analogy, his, his example in this case, of saying what would happen if a candy seller was to run against a physician. And the candy seller would say to the people, well, he pricks you and prods you and cuts you and feeds you bitter potions that you don't like, and I sell you things that make you happy. Well, of course, the masses are going to flock right to that candy seller, aren't they? And in the same way they flock to that candy seller in that hypothetical situation, so too do they seem to flock to the most appealing, folksy-looking bullshit merchant that's out there. 
even those who come from positions of affluence, as Trump has, but even across the board and on the other side, think about it this way. How often do we see these candidates out and about in public? I, too, like hot dogs. I, too, drink beer. I, too, like pizza. And then the people just say, oh, they're just like me. Is that necessarily a good thing? A fun little thought experiment, if we will. Consider yourself. Now consider your social circle, your friends, your family, your co-workers, the people you drink with at the bar. Amongst them, how many can you really pick that you would vest the power of the office of president in? How many do you think should be leading the free world? And why is it, time and time again, that this nonsensical, folksy, I'm just like you kind of appeal so often seems to override more pressing qualifications. Now granted, in the 2016 election, we did also have the major problem that was Hillary, I don't need to campaign, I'm just the anointed one Clinton, losing the election. And let's remember, Trump didn't altogether win the election as much as Hillary just lost it. And even to this day, I can't really imagine how awful things would be under her leadership either. But all the same, when it comes to these questions of what solid qualifications our leaders ought to have, why is it that nonsensical folksiness so oftentimes seems to jump out in front of people? Granted, nobody really likes the concept of a technocracy. Uh, government run by and ruled by experts in given fields. This oftentimes being because an expert in a given field often is kind of myopic in their thinking. An economist is not the kind of person you want making policy on the environment. A climatologist, perhaps, is not the ideal person to run the Department of Defense, etc., etc. However, all the same, in this rush to embrace ideals that we need people who represent us by reflecting our more simple natures. Are we not cutting ourselves off at the knees a bit? After all, this is possibly one of the most embarrassing presidencies ever. Perhaps not the absolute worst, as we did have George W. Bush, who likewise ran on that notion of who would you rather have a beer with, rather than any actual concept of statecraft, leadership skills, or an ability to genuinely lead the country forward in a meaningful way. From W, we had now nearly 20 years of unwinnable wars. Under Trump, well, there is a recession kind of looming, isn't there? But all the same, in these guttural, off-the-cuff sort of opinion formations of potential leaders, is it really worth finding yourself reflected in an office that you yourself probably wouldn't want to be in in the first place? Because let's keep in mind, I can't think of a president in my lifetime, more probably ever, who's managed to go through four to eight years of being in office without coming out the other end looking like they'd aged 30 years in the process. As we go forward, be it congressional elections, mayoral races, governors, senators, or the president. Perhaps it's time we began pushing back on this notion that the folksy, he's one of us kind of appeals is something that actually matters or resonates. Oftentimes, even though it's a work of fantasy, I like to think back to the West Wing, Aaron Sorkin's White House drama. And within that, regardless of ideology, party, or any of it, the better aspects, the better natures of many of the characters, both on the Republican and Democrat sides, were embodied not so much by how folksy and ordinary they were, but by how wonky and invested in the issues that they were working on that they were. I can even remember one uh, series of, I think it was a two-parter episode, where the president, played by... Uh, um, Martin Sheen steps down amidst a personal crisis, and the Speaker of the House takes over, played by John Goodman, and he was a bullish Republican. And yet at the end of it, as when he stepped back into his role as Speaker, and Bartlett, in this case, re retook the office, one of the things the character said is, I never wanted to be president. And even within that, that sort of dedication to statecraft, 
even though it was a work of fiction, was something that these characters, that the writing really focused on. And the very notion of stately processes, of intelligent, qualified, capable people, going into office and being public servants is radically and dramatically seeming to be eroded over time, as people look more and more to the cults of personality built up around the people seeking office, looking to install them, oftentimes simply just because it's their favorite brand of reality TV star, rather than a qualified leader who can in fact work tirelessly on issues and some way to attempt to make the world a better place. If we continue giving in to these guttural instincts of ours, if we continue playing into these pathetic games of who can be the folksiest hot dog eating beer swilling ordinary every man, well then we're going to end up with a much, much sadder version of King Ralph than we will ever see. President Josiah Bartlett. Hmm. Anyway, thank you as always for tuning in. Hope you found something to chew on here. And as always, I suppose I'll see you in the next video.